Good morning. It is Sunday, October the 9th, and it is Thanksgiving Sunday. Thankfulness. How do we approach thankfulness in a time when you look at the news and it can be challenging to see the things that we might uh, find ourselves being thankful for? Uh, if anything, we might have sort of a, a backhanded thankfulness, like I'm thankful I'm not living name your place where there's a a disaster or something like that going on. That's not what we're talking about. We've been going through the series in Ephesians and and looking at how we thrive in our faith in trying times. And the reality is there's a lot wrapped up in that because it's not only that we want to have a thriving faith, we want to have that faith that can be um, an example for those around us to follow. It can be an impact for those that we're wanting to influence for Christ. Um, When we think of our kids, we want them to have a thriving faith. How do we model that? How do we teach that? So as we've been going through Ephesians as sort of the backdrop for this, I want us to look then in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up today in verse 15, paying particular attention to verse 19. Uh, in it, we find thankfulness wrapped up and really moving us in that verse in the direction we want to go this morning. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. It says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Again, written 2,000 years ago-ish, and it sounds like today's time. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. And then here's this key verse for this morning. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness. Um, certainly it's, it's an expected theme on Thanksgiving weekend. But it's more than that. Why is it a good thing? And how is it that it helps us to develop a thriving faith? I think there's a number of things that go along with it. First off... Thankfulness keeps us on the page of recognizing who provides all things to us. God is where we draw our lives from. Um, There's no other source of our being. It's Him. Secondly, thankfulness also keeps us on the page of being directed towards God, which has has the benefit of keeping us from directing our lives to other things. And in saying that, we begin to get a sense of of where we're going this morning, directing our lives towards other things. If thankfulness keeps us on the page of appreciating all that we've received from God and all that He is for us, then having an absence of thankfulness begins us down a path that, frankly, can lead into some pretty nasty directions. Um, When we're not thankful, we ultimately end up attributing our lives and the benefits that we receive in our lives to other things. And in actuality, that becomes idolatry. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, whoa, how do you jump from being thankful to not being thankful to, whoa, way over here to idolatry. In fact, it's not a long leap. It's actually a very short one. Let me explain what I mean. It's not like when we stop being thankful or if we diminish the place of thankfulness in our lives that we all of a sudden run out and start worshiping Baal. We're not on that kind of Old Testament page. But there is something to be said for thankfulness being wrapped up in what God said when he said, as the first commandment, worship me only. 
One of the things about worship is that it directs our hearts to one who is greater than us, to one who is not only superior in his uh, power, in all of the qualities that make up our God, but worship also directs us towards that place of reminding ourselves of everything that God has given us, given to us, and also then reminding ourselves that we're not getting those things from anywhere else. When God said in, if, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 4, where he says, do not make for yourselves any um, idol in any form, not of anything, not anything in creation, not anything that you see, not anything that uh, you experience, and certainly not any one. And again, we may be looking at that and going, okay, so we have to be thankful, we have to worship God, because if we fall off that page, we'll start worshiping something else. Well, literally, yeah, that's how it happens. Uh, What are some examples of this? Well, when we start to attribute uh, what we have to something else, um, we're going to... find ourselves going down one of two paths that are very closely related. Um, When we start to attribute uh, what we have and who we are, what we've become in life, if we don't see that those things stem from the blessing of God and from the provisions of God, the things that we're thankful for, then we're very, very close to attributing them to something else. Follow this train of thought. When we think of where we are in life, um, it can be easy to go down one of two paths. If we think we're successful, we can attribute that to our intelligence, our abilities, our skills, our talents, any of those things. Conversely, if we're uh, looking at our lives and we're not thinking that we're that, that successful, we can go down the path of saying, well, it's because I'm not this and I don't have that ability and I never went to school there or I don't have that kind of um, skill set. And do you see what happens? We look at ourselves in one form or another, positive or negative, and from that, then we draw the, the ultimate conclusion that we are either successful or not successful because of us. And, and that's a dangerous conclusion to draw in this regard, because in both instances, there's a lack of thankfulness. There's a lack of appreciating all that God has given in both instances. Let's face it. If we see ourselves as being all that, then usually we arrive at that conclusion because we look around and go, I've got it better than them. Oh, I'm completely better than her. Oh, and him and his family? Whoa, way up on them. Do you see? Success is drawn from the the matrix of comparison. And then the flip side of it is, if we look around and go, oh, I don't have what they have and they have, then we've drawn ourselves onto a, a scale where we don't meet that bar. And the problem then is that we, in comparing ourselves to others, we find ourselves being less thankful. There it is again, a lack of thankfulness, because even if we perceive of ourselves as here and not here, the problem with that is that we forget what we have here. And, you know, especially in North America, uh, the place that, that we find ourselves in is one of being profoundly blessed. Uh, You know, we need to be reminded every now and again that we live in a society that that, um, has so many benefits to it that, you know, even if we look at ourselves and say, oh, well, I'm not as blessed as, say, somebody else, or I'm not as fortunate, I'm not as successful, on on a worldwide scale, Other people would envy our place. Uh, 
hugely. Compared to others, we have much. And so, again, in the absence of that broader spec, uh, spectrum, that broader understanding, perspective of thankfulness, we can either um, find ourselves elevating ourselves or viewing ourselves less than we ought to. Um, one of the individuals who got caught in the trap of believing himself more than he ought to was Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel uh, chapter 4, verse 30, we have this guy saying this, uh, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by the mighty power and the glory of my majesty? Wow, who talks like that? But that was Nebuchadnezzar. He looked at himself and, and saw that everything around him he achieved and in that fourth chapter of Daniel, we see God, uh, you know, warning him in a dream and using Daniel to explain that to him and saying, hey, you know, uh, slow down there, guy. You need to take a look around. And, you know, he's warned, pull back this pride of yours, this, this sense that I have built all of this is just really creating a... a a setup for a fall, which is what happened. Uh, God took it all away from him. And for a period of seven years, Nebuchadnezzar um, literally was an outcast. Uh, it says that his hair grew long, his fingernails grew long, that he survived by eating grass like a, you know, like a cow or an ox. And history actually records this seven-year sort of gap in Nebuchadnezzar's reign where it's like he disappeared for a season and then he comes back onto history's page. And this is exactly what was going on. And he had to humble himself and acknowledge the God of heaven. He had to worship him. How do we fall into this trap in our life? You know, again, I don't, think that there's many of us that that sit around and go, well, look at what I've got. And it's just a wonderful uh, tribute to the great power I have and to the glory of my majesty. You know, even in our worst moments, I hope we're not talking like that. But we can fall into the trap of pride. We can fall into this, uh, you know, while the words may be different, the sentiment is the same as Nebuchadnezzar. We think that what we have and all that we have is because of what we did or who we are, um, what we have been able to do with ourselves. We believe that we are the reason for where we are in life. And the moment we attribute position or influence, power, or popularity, or possessions, all of those things, the moment we attribute those to ourselves, then we're starting down the path of worshiping ourselves. And by that I mean ascribing too much worth to ourselves. It's one thing to have a healthy self-esteem, but I don't think anyone would think it healthy to refer to themselves as the creator of all that we have and the, you know, an expression of our mighty power and the glory of our majesty. That's kind of narcissistic. We can, in fact, become the God that we place our worship in. And the reality is we need a check on our spirits. We need a check on our attitudes. When we become God in place of the one that we need to worship, when we become, uh, you know, the one who is thankful for all that we have because of all that we are, then we've missed the one that we need to direct our thankfulness towards, and that is our Heavenly Father. That's why Paul said in Ephesians, we need to always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. The other thing that can happen is in the absence of thankfulness, in missing that everything that we have around us is God-given, 
we can feel the need, um, and and this is this, you know, if there's something absent, absent, then we fill it with something else. You know, there's the expression, nature abhors a vacuum. In other words, an empty space will be occupied by something else. Um, in the absence of filling that God shaped place in our lives with worship and the acknowledgement of him, the thankfulness of him, then sensing that emptiness, we can begin to fill it with other things. We can fill our lives with experiences. Um, We can fill our lives with possessions. If we have this, if we do this, um, frankly, we can fill our lives with distractions. Uh, We can make idols of a whole bunch of things, be it sports or entertainment, whatever that might be. Um, The reality is it's also true. We can fill that empty place with addictions where uh, in the absence of directing our lives towards God and having him be the focal point of our lives, then we are on a short path to not only um, filling our lives with other things, but looking in our lives for the answers to um, maybe the pain of our lives, the hurts that we've experienced, um, the loneliness, any number of those things. We can start looking for things to Um, address what we perceive as those needs and addictions are an easy path to go down. And in the end, what we've done is just a different form of what Nebuchadnezzar did. He had a God-shaped vacuum in his life. He filled it with himself. You know, he looked at himself and said, all this? I did this. My mighty power and the glory of my majesty. If we fill that God-shaped vacuum inside us with ourselves, we'll get puffed up. We're not big enough to take that space. But then the other side of it is, if we begin to fill that that God-shaped hole within us with possessions, with Uh, experiences with power, with influence, with all kinds of distractions leading to addictions, the reality is we've crammed all those things in there and hoped that they would fill the void. And they can't. And we end up making idols of them because we attribute to them uh, that place and that space that needs to be occupied by God. Do you see? If we have that empty place in our lives that needs to be filled with God, then the moment we take something else and put it in there, we've effectively said, God, nope. Uh, Entertainment, yes. Distractions, yes. Possessions, oh, a whole bunch of these. Um, Power, influence, uh, you know, experiences. I will idolize those things. And the reality is, in a social media age, all of those things are being advertised as alternatives. We're encouraged to see the experiences of others and in a measure, through that, to envy them. And the effect that it has is nothing short of breaking what God said in it. In Exodus 20, verse 4, don't make idols. Don't put those things in the place of me. When we do that, we've stopped being thankful, we've stopped worshiping him, and we've given that place to something else. Thankfulness is a safeguard. It keeps us from placing too much stock in ourselves, And it keeps us from placing too much stock in other things. And in this way, we worship God and we avoid making idols of something else. You know, this is something that is critical. 
uh, to have a thriving faith in trying times. Trying times take our eyes away from the Lord and, and we start looking at other things. Sometimes we start looking at ourselves. If we're to have a thriving faith, it needs to be something that we not only experience in our relationship with God, but it needs to be something that we teach to our kids too. You know, there are lots of opportunities to show our kids that, hey, filling that God-shaped space in us with stuff or with a view of ourselves that isn't healthy, really, bottom line, it's idolatry. And God said, don't do it. It's a trap. It's one that when it springs on you, it's only then that you realize that you've given a place uh, that belongs only to God. You've given it to something far less. Nebuchadnezzar is a great example of somebody who after seven years came to realize, oh, I took that place that God deserves and I gave it to myself. And, you know, we, we laugh and we look at, you know, something like the foolishness of somebody saying, you know, by my mighty power and for the majesty of my glory, I've done all this. You know, come on. But maybe we've entertained something similar just using less grandiose language. The effect is the same. We fill the place that belongs to God with something other than Him. And we pay a price for it. History is that. It is people giving that place that belongs to God, giving it to, to uh, filling it with other things, filling it with themselves. It's so critical then that when we look at today and, and, you know, with it being Thanksgiving Sunday, that we recognize the true amazing nature and character of God. There is a place in each of our lives that is uniquely God-shaped that we need to fill with Him. And we don't. And we chase after other things and we do things that, that really just clutter up that space. But consider the depth of the love of God and what he did to create that space again when he sent Christ to die on the cross. We're celebrating communion and in it, we're acknowledging and, and being so thankful that here is God looking at our lives and in his grace, his mercy, and his love, he's saying, let's empty that space again. And let's, let's consider me filling that place in your life. I invite you to fill that space with me. That's what Christ did on the cross. He gave us the opportunity to sweep that room clean and to fill it with him. When he died, he paid the price for all of the junk that we've thrown in that room. All of the stuff that we filled that God-shaped vacuum with. That he did, dying on the cross. And you know, in, in preparation for that, he explained the importance of it to his disciples. And on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had broke it, he gave it to them and he said, take and eat. Participate in me. And you know, it's a very uh, vivid illustration when you consider that Christ took this very simple thing that we need for life, food, and he said, I am this food. Take it in. Fill that place in you that is God-shaped with me. It's an incredible invitation. It came at the cost of his sacrifice on Calvary. 
Let's eat together. The next thing that Christ told his disciples was, again, that illustration that was so poignant to them. They knew the cup of the covenant. They knew that participating in a cup was like a cup of agreement. And so when he took this cup, he called it a new covenant in his blood. And by sacrificing himself, by shedding his life blood on the cross, he was opening the way and inviting us into a new agreement between God and mankind. It was an agreement that would be opened up by Christ dying on the cross, by looking at him as the sacrifice for our sins and the removing of all of those things that we could place in that God-shaped vacuum in our lives, given the opportunity to invite Christ in to fill that room, to fill that space. By taking the cup, he's saying, there is a new covenant now made between God and mankind. And when you participate in it, when you drink this cup, it's like you're agreeing with God that this is the best way for us to live. Let's drink together. Jesus provides this invitation, and let me encourage you this morning. It's Thanksgiving Sunday, and each one of us has a place uh, that within our lives is God-shaped. We've been using that a lot to explain this this morning. Let me encourage you, if you've never taken the opportunity and the invitation of Christ to fill that space with him, let me encourage you to do that. Reach out. Talk to someone who can explain this to you, but the reality is we're talking about inviting Christ into our lives to pay the price for our sins, and to fill that space within us. We're saying that we no longer want to fill that space with anything other than him, because the reality is nothing else fills that space like he does. Again, it's Thanksgiving Sunday in one week's time. On Sunday, October the 16th, we are going to be uh, really bringing Pumpkin Fest to a close. Well, how do you do that? You take the big pumpkins and you drop them. Uh, the growers have left a wide assortment of uh, gourds and squash and pumpkins for us to drop and to have a whole lot of fun doing it. Let me encourage you following the service on Sunday, October the 16th, to join with us uh, for this time of celebration and fun. Uh, Harvey Design and Build is partnering with the church to uh, host this event, and all proceeds, all donations, are going to be going to Keystone Counseling. It's a resource for children and youth in our community, and we wanted to be able to provide that assistance to them. Let's pray. Father, there is a space in our lives that can only be filled by you. And Lord, while we may not see it as idolatry, the reality is anytime we fill that space with anything other than you, be it ourselves in a a puffed up, uh, inflated sense of who we are, or filling that space with experiences, possessions, power, influence, whatever it might be, the reality is we're attributing those things we put in that space the kind of worship and thankfulness that you alone deserve. And that's idolatry. Lord, keep us from it. Lord, help us to be good stewards of this knowledge and to explain how this works and what our lives are supposed to look like in you. As we explain that to our kids, to our grandkids, to uh, those around us, Lord, may it be that they can appreciate what it is that we're saying. 
that there is a place that you deserve to have, that you long to have in each one of our lives, and that you sent your son Jesus to the cross so that we could see Christ fill that space in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, bless us to this end and make us ever thankful, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today.
breaking through the night I won't move until you speak Oh